Soon after mezzo-soprano Malena Dayen embarked on directing opera, she found herself on the very frontier of new media. The pandemic started just as she was finishing up her MFA in performance and interactive media arts from CUNY Brooklyn College, which meant she had to rework the live performance project, which was supposed to be her thesis. So what did she do? She directed the first opera in virtual reality, of course. It was The Presence of Odradek, an opera after a short story by Franz Kafka, which premiered in May 2020. Besides being an imaginative director, Malena is a versatile vocalist. She sings both quote-unquote standard operatic repertoire and also, most prominently with her duo New Airs Tango, specializes in Spanish music and tango. She is also part of the vocal improvisation ensemble Moving Star based at Carnegie Hall and a collaborative artist at the Vile Music Institute, among other performance engagements. It's hard to believe that Malena only just embarked on her parallel career as an opera director, given that she has already employed more new media than many opera directors do in an entire career. Technology isn't just some gimmick to her, however. She's interested in what she calls the magic of opera, the surreal, the fantastical, the dreamlike, and she sees new technologies as a way to explore that. Malena doesn't want audiences to walk away from her productions thinking about the technology, but lost in the magic it conjured. Malena and I talk about virtual reality, how technology changes singing, the magical elements of opera, and the so far still irreplicable qualities of live performance, among other things. By the way, quick apology, the background noise you hear in some parts of the recording are Malena's son, who is going to school online right now for obvious reasons. Artists have lives, just like everyone else, and you can't always put them on hold. I've sung all my life, my my family, it's a very musical family, although uh, nobody's a a professional uh, artist. My parents are... uh, psychoanalysts (laughs) psychoanalysts <laughs> um, my brother dances tango so I guess he's he's a he's an artist too um, uh, and um, I always sang and I, it took me a while to find to accept that this is what I wanted to do as a as a career uh, though um, but but I did I did my undergrad in in, in Buenos Aires as a as a singer um, although um, opera was not something that I really grew up with. In, in my education, I ended. I really was fascinated by by opera. It was really interesting because it, it was a very unorthodox education, really based on my curiosity, and it, it wasn't a structure the way that I see sometimes in the U.S. education for for musicians is. Um, it was really based on what was interesting for me, and I think that shows now in my, in, in the way I am as an artist. Um, I, when in the beginning in two, 2001, I moved here to New York to study to do my masters as a, for as an opera singer. I I married right before coming to the U.S. Um, with David Rosenmeier, an amazing uh, orchestral conductor musician, composer, and all kinds of awesome things. Um, So he did his master's um, in conducting at Manes here in New York. And I did my my master's as an opera singer, as a mezzo-soprano. So the next (laughs) 17 years were as an education as an opera singer and really focused on that uh, in classical singing. And I had a very fun career that uh, although seen now as a director from this other, from this new identity I have, um, feels limited only to singing. I was singing tango, I was, you know, doing all kinds of uh, fun uh, projects. I always felt a little like, uh, I, I had teachers over and over telling me, you need to focus on one thing and what you do is your specialty. And I was like, but I like so many things. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, it was always very eclectic. And um, a few years ago, I mean, the, the seed of my transition to directing came out of a, an Argentinian piece called uh, Maria de Buenos Aires. It's a Piazzolla piece that I had 
um, that is a very strange piece itself. It's uh, tango music, but it's kind of operatic and it's kind of like an oratorio and sometimes it's um, scenified and sometimes it's done as a ballet or sometimes only orchestral. And I sang it a few times in other people's uh, productions, just hired as a singer. And I always had a very strong feeling that I wanted to do it in a different way, that I had a different interpretation for it. And in a chat with a with a colleague one day, she said, well, just do it. You know, whatever you want to do, why don't you just put it together? Um, and uh, it was a long process, but now seeing it from the other side, I see that um, it really sparked the idea in, in me that, yeah, I could do it. I didn't need to wait for an organization, for a director to to understand my vision, but I could myself uh, make it happen and put the, the team together. Um, and I did, and in, the, in, in that transition to understanding this is what I wanted to do, I also realized I needed to study um, <laughs> and to learn more. Um, so I found a, a wonderful MFA program um, in, in Brooklyn College that was um, that was specific about the use of technology. Um, I'm, it's something I was very interested in. And at least here in the US, there, there's not a lot of um, training programs for opera directors. There's directors for, you know, for theater. Or the, the few programs I found that are specific about opera are really a, for people coming from theater for them to learn the musical part. And I was doing mm. the other, mm. <laughs> it was coming the other and the other way. Yeah. Um, and uh, I found this really wonderful program that it's, um, it's called PIMA, Performance and Interactive Media Arts. Mm. Um, and the, everybody comes from different disciplines. So mm. you really get to collaborate. I'm still collaborating with all my my classmates in seven mm. different projects. Um, so I really learned, I opened my head. I learned a lot about um, performance art and more contemporary, uh, more experimental kinds of um, expression uh, and art. Um, and since then, I mean, I, I, I've graduated last May. Uh, I presented a, a, a new piece uh, that we created online, uh, live online. And uh, so I directed that, that Maria de Buenos Aires, that was uh, April 2019. Um, and I did since then several productions with uh, two, mainly two independent companies here in New York. Uh, but yeah, I'm, you know, it, it really exploded in lots of different ways. <laughs> Yeah, you did a lot in those couple years, I yes. noticed. <laughs> yes. So since you mentioned Odradek, um, can you say something about this project? Because that's that's probably one of the most out there and like uh, unique Corona projects that I've heard of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So that's far. great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Odradek was my thesis project for this, this uh, master's program. Our idea when we were... Uh, we started really inspired on one, uh, this Kafka story, short story. We wanted to create an operatic event um, that we we were planning to do in a small theater downtown here in New York in, in May 2020. In March 2020, <laughs> we realized that wouldn't happen. And it, it was great that we were forced, many in, in other many companies decided to postpone those kind of projects since this was my thesis and it had a deadline and I wanted to graduate we we were forced into doing something um, in which we could work separately and from home so we adapted the work and um, yeah we, we tried all different technologies in which the artist could be performing live uh, adapted the music so that so it allowed for delays and for you know the the challenges of working online um but the piece was a little was quite crazy even before the pandemic to be honest it, it really from the it was a very experimental concept right from the beginning the um, the for example the last number um that it, it included singers from 
different countries improvising on a theme. And then my husband uh, was the composer of the piece, did an edit with all of those recordings. But that was an idea that was, you know, the recordings were made in October 2019. Mm. So oh, it was, okay. yeah, it, that concept oh. was pre-pandemic. Um, and then it, it was actually, this is something you'll appreciate that it was interesting. When we did the first um, recording of that song in the end of 2019, we had all the videos and it was like a little zoom with everybody in the in the windows and then when we were putting it together in march we were like this is not original anymore <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody's seen it so we know all the time so we ended up doing this vr space where people were we were repeating their faces and it, it changed that way but we were like oh this is people singing That's from so their places changed <laughs> changed the meaning of that yeah mm -hmm. So tell me about this VR space because uh, I mean I I don't I haven't heard of another virtual reality opera so far maybe oh, maybe it's out there somewhere but cool. I think this is the only one. Um, <laughs> I think so too. I didn't hear about anything like yeah. that. Um, look, the, I, I I worked with an amazing colleague, Sang Ming Che. Um, I work with him in every project I did so far, and he's like my tech. Uh, wizard um this was his idea the idea of creating a space where people and, and i love and we are actually working on a new we have a new idea uh, furthering that concept um we like the idea of just changing changing the experience we were very aware that people are stuck home that everything looks the same <laughs> And they um, and that you they, the audience has no uh, agency. They can't do anything. They just sit there and they have to. Um, yeah, we were trying to see how we can give the audience a little more something to do, something where they if they move it really changes and it, be, it becomes unique in for their experience that way. We thought it was yeah more interesting, more immersive. You know. Um, given the fact that this forum being like this online is not immersive at all, um, that people are, you know, there's such a distance that you need to reach when, when somebody dresses up and buys a ticket and go to the theater, you're already in an agreement. When they're home, you know, it's uh, we were trying to see how can we get them closer, get them more in, immersed, more involved. So the audience was involved by being able to choose kind of where they look in the space. Yes. yes. And it was some kind of like nebulous space where there was different things in different levels and they could kind of go through it. Is that how it is? Like almost like a gallery, maybe? Correct. Like a gallery. Like mm. if you were if you were doing a an apartment tour or a museum tour, mm. so you can you can move you can move a little, and now if the singer is singing here, you can mm. turn. Um, so depending on what device, I mean, it, it's ideally created for those uh, mm. glasses, but I don't think anybody had yeah. those. But if if you had a tablet or a phone mm. or even in your computer with the, just your mouse, you could mm -hmm. change your your perspective. For Odra Deke, it was only that. You can yeah. ch change your perspective, but also you had to. There were moments in which, especially this last number with the improvisers, you had to look up and down. <laughs> ah, uh, and did you have to cue? No, because you hear the it, the, um, the sound was mapped, mm. so you actually hear it coming from above. Oh, you know okay. something is going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like you, you want to move to see what's what's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, no, we tried to, uh, it, I mean, once the show started, we didn't cue anything. Uh, we mm -hmm. told people, in, we, we recorded a few videos for our audience that was more technologically challenged. We, we really step mm -hmm. by step, you need to connect here and then this is how you move. Yeah. But once it started, I mean, you could still enjoy the show without moving anything. If you put it in the TV, mm -hmm. there's still a show. But it mm -hmm. had the extra the extra uh, mm -hmm. agency of moving a little. We're, we're planning actually uh, another project is still in the, in the beginning, but mm -hmm. where you can actually walk in a space and choose different rooms. Um, like mm -hmm. if it was, 
um, I don't know if you know this piece, Sleep No More. I think it happened all over the world where it's it's a not hotel and there's performances happening in every room. So the oh. audience moves around and uh, can pick mm -hmm. the order of the story in, uh, according to how they walk around the space. Mm -hmm. So we're designing something like that. Um, it's mm -hmm. actually a castle where depending on where you go, you see different things and you find the singer mm -hmm. singing in the different spaces. It's interesting because I've said before that, that installation art or this kind of performing performance art is like one of the last things that is very difficult to convey through video. It's one of the last things that really forces you to be in the space. But now I see that the technology is is sort of kind of it's not quite there but it's sort of heading in the in the direction yeah it's at the very it's really a young technology it's very primitive still at the very beginning of its of its possibilities but what what is still lacking there what what would you if you if you had to tell someone what what are you missing when you don't go to a physical performance oh it's it, it, look in, <laughs> it's hard hard to measure yeah there's there i mean it's in, in, infinite um mm -hmm how it's like having a date in Zoom, what are yeah. you missing? Um, and still, uh, and still there's something. I'm still, I mean, I, I still ache for everything that we're missing, but but since we are stuck with this, <laughs> I, I found it actually interesting. There's lots of little things that are cool. Um, I, for example, in, in Odra, like there, was a, there was a chat and I found fascinating the conversations that people could have during the show. That's something yeah. that doesn't happen in the theater, for mm -hmm. example. Um, I don't know. It's yeah, we are like in the middle of the storm with this with this technology, and it looked to me like this is like a little window that opened. Um, yeah, like I don't know, I had this dream before where I'm, I'm in my apartment and I find a new room. I don't know if you had mm -hmm. that any like <laughs> that dream before. It's like wow, uh. I had this room all along and I didn't know. <laughs> it feels like that. Like this mm -hmm. is a new window of creativity mm -hmm. that I don't know if it will stay as a, an art form or not. Mm -hmm. um, but for the moment, it seems super relevant. And yeah. it's it's uh, it's exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> we will <laughs> see. Um, yeah. What what is what is lacking on a technical level? There, we, there's a lot of things that are still developing. I mean, we cannot mm -hmm. make musical together. Mm -hmm. So so far, you will not see have an orchestra and a singer at the same time right now online. That's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Every time you see it. So at least one, I mean, one can be live, but uh, the rest is pre-recorded. So mm -hmm. all the live magic, smells, mm -hmm. vibration, all of that is not there. Yeah. Um, but it's still, still there's some magic things that mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, can be really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's opening, yeah. yeah, a way of creativity, I think. But uh, when when things open again, you you do plan to uh, launch again or uh, throw yourself again at the live performing and live uh, directing live theater. <laughs> I I have a I have a gig this summer in Europe and in the fall here in New York two productions. So those are those are all live. Yeah, and that that is all live. But we are using quite a bit of technology, so it's mm -hmm. not the technology of working in online this way mm -hmm. but we're using a lot of interact uh, interactive technology uh, with you know it, it may be less original than all this mm -hmm. uh, live stuff but it, still mm -hmm. we're trying to push um we're doing live live feed of the video of, of mm -hmm. the singer that it's uh, projected and mm -hmm. in that interacts mm -hmm. with the music so the yeah. the I mean, you see the singer live, but the, in the projection, you see a filtered image that it interacts with mm -hmm. what the orchestra is doing. Are there any other kind of surprising uh, technologies that aren't as maybe as explored in opera that you learned about during your masters? A, a lot of things. I learned a lot of things. Um, I'm especially interested in this, uh, the little things that look very mm -hmm. magical. Mm -hmm. um, that's what what, it, what is interesting for me. Uh, in the use of technology on stage mm -hmm. 
um, I'm, I'm going to mention something very silly, but um, that blew my mind when I saw it the first time. Just a colleague of mine who had videoed um, the scenography and mm -hmm. was projecting the image of the scenography over it. So when it moved, mm -hmm. it became, you know, it looked like the whole thing was moving. Mm -hmm. um, just there are little details like that, um, yeah. but that make, um, yeah, that in, in which I, it, hopefully you don't go out of my production saying, wow, the tech was great. Yeah, uh, you know, but it's like wow, that was magical. I saw mm. something that um, that that's what it's interesting I, yeah, uh, yeah. to me. So they may be not necessarily a super great tech advancement, but it's more mm. like a creative use that mm. can reflect something that you wouldn't be able to do with just painted mm -hmm. a painted scenery. You, you talk about this in your artist statement on your website. You say that you want to look at the subconscious and surreal. So what brought you to surrealism or to, to your interest in this kind of, this kind of magicalness? Um, it's, it's who I am. I'm in that yeah. world all the time. <laughs> um, I, I just think that opera has a lot of it, a lot mm -hmm. of that uh, in the, in the fabric of it. Mm -hmm. And that, sometimes it doesn't come through in, in the productions that productions mm. become really real, realistic, mm -hmm. like super, like trying to reproduce mm -hmm. um, reality. And uh, it's not what it's, I mean, in general, what it's attracting to me, what it moves me about opera is all this, mm -hmm. this other part, the more, more emotional, more magical, more mm. um, yeah, surreal. So, yeah. Yeah, the fact that we're talking about feelings and we can have a singer stand there for seven minutes just repeating and repeating about this one feeling, this one revelation, mm. this one mm. realization. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm very curious on finding ways to bring that, amplify that mm -hmm. in, in my productions. Do you think this also might have something to do with the fact that magical realism is such a big part of, of uh, South American culture and yes, heritage brilliant. and also in what Argentina particularly? Yeah, what yeah. a brilliant comment. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> yes, yes, very much. I th yeah, I, th I think so. It's, it's really how I see what, what yeah. is moving to me, at least, mm. what calls me. Um, yeah. And I keep finding myself, with it. I'm working now on a production of El Amor Brujo, uh, the mm -hmm. Faya. It's, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, I open the book and it's like, oh, here I am. <laughs> the same, <laughs> these pieces keep finding me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's really, in a way, I, I feel like I live in that world. It may be because mm -hmm. of how, how, where I grew up. Or, um, but um, it's also I'm I'm Jewish. My my mm. my my ancestors came from from Ukraine, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have some Spanish as well. And both in both those cultures, mm. this is part of the culture as well, mm. in, with different colors. But there's yeah, there's this magic uh, yeah. in in their cultures as well. I think it's pretty universal too, but it, it, these flavors are, yeah, yes. it's very deep in me. Yeah. Speaking of magic and opera, what is your definition of opera? <laughs> if you had to give an elevator definition. <laughs> uh, oh, this is so difficult. Um, it is. And that's so fascinating that it's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> look, I had this fight. I'm going to make an aside before, it, mm. it, while I think about the definition. But because uh, in this world of experimental theater, where I found myself in the last few mm -hmm. years, the word opera is thrown around yeah. so easily. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anything, it's an opera. Um, so I found myself rolling my eyes and, and say, well, it's okay. You call it opera. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, um, it's, it's, it, it, it means different things from different people. Yeah. I come from a very a class, classical training and, mm -hmm. um, and I, I teach. So uh, for me, opera, operatic sound is, means something. Mm -hmm. Operatic feeling means something quite specific. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, then I do appreciate that there's contemporary opera that has a more, mm-hmm. you know, that takes a different flavor wherever it's composed. Um, and it, and it's moving, one could say it's moving away from what I think opera is. Another somebody else can say it's developing into something, mm-hmm. something new. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, opera is intense, it's big, it's mm-hmm. loud, um, it's magical, I guess we were mm-hmm. saying before. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's also theater, um, mm-hmm. and it's, it can also be movement, and it's also amazing orchestral music. Um, but yeah, the, the core is the, the singing, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what makes it so recognizable. So you think opera is also defined by the style of singing, the operatic yeah. style of singing, yeah? Yeah, I think so. I, what, what would be the difference? Why don't we call opera a Broadway piece that is all, also theater, also musical, mm. also orchestral? Yeah, that's true. Um, it's because it sounds different. Uh, it's just the production. Mm. The, the, I think there's something uh, not only stylistic, but in the experience mm. uh, of the intensity of the sc- of the, the, the kind of vocal production that can carry in a huge theater with no mic. Mm-hmm. There's something yeah. uh, uh, that is a physical, ex- an emotional experience mm-hmm. uh, for, the, for the audience with that kind of production that I think it's mm-hmm. very specific. That makes me think about how uh, tragic it is that now we have the only way we can really experience opera for, on most, in most of the world is, this, is through mics. Um, and it really is complicated. Um, it's complicated to capture that voice. Actually, as a singer, since also because Odradek had to be recorded, it had to be pre-recorded. What are some of your thoughts on on capturing uh, operatic singing in, or you know, classical? What's called classical singing in in the studio? Well, the studio may be different. But mm-hmm. all of my experience this year was not the studio, was singers mm-hmm. at home trying to figure out with the oh, headphones. Okay. Um, in a studio, you usually have mega headphones, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a really high quality sound. My, I had to record, I sang in Odradek, but I also sang it for other projects during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It's not fun. Uh, to yeah. sing with you know you put the headphone and you're trying to hear the accompaniment in the headphone and sing sing well and in a controlled way that is totally different than singing live just mm-hmm. that it's just more uh, manicured and uh, tamed mm-hmm. um yeah as you were saying before there's there's that's one thing that we are losing in in mm-hmm. this moment, this this quality, this wildness, this mm-hmm. kind of uh, beastly quality that has the, the, mm-hmm. the operatic singing in, in its best, but um, yeah, that that's the issue. You need you need when we are figuring out the tech to get the best possible quality. Mm-hmm. In my personal experience, yeah. we end up sing under singing uh, mm-hmm. for the mic. Yeah just to control um mm-hmm. eh, you know it's one of the things yeah. we, we are we are kind of losing mm-hmm. um i still think it's better than nothing yeah. uh, than, than <laughs> singing but mm-hmm. yeah I, I mean, I think some singers would have more issues with this than others. I think you are an incredibly versatile vocalist because you don't just <laughs> sing uh, opera. Um, I, I saw some clips of you uh, with uh, New, Ar- uh, New Air's Tango, this yes. duo. <laughs> yes. um, and it, I mean, it's riveting. It's riveting yeah, music. It's so expressive. <laughs> and um, I, re- I mean, so I really and I mean, I just admire your 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 vocality <laughs> in this, um, in how you uh, do it so Thank I you think so and, much. and you're I'm singing so for a microphone. Emma. Yes. Oh no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I I also get embarrassed when people <laughs> compliment. But it's so um, nice. Not to make you, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you're singing on for a microphone in this. But but I have to say, when when I sing with New Ideas, I get, I have a nice condenser mic that I place far mm. from me. I'm not like singing here. Mm-hmm. I place it far, mm-hmm. and I'm either with with David at the piano with a mm-hmm. with a big big piano or with a band. So it's mm. still the feeling is really you know yeah. out. 
it's really wild. Um, mm. When when singing here at home, there's there's just a level. I don't know mm. if it has to do with the the headphones or the. Um, yeah. I don't know. I I found it and I saw it also in my colleagues when I had to mm -hmm. direct singers to do it too. That it's just people give a little less when the CD technology came out, and they, it, for many singers, they, there was a change on the way people had to sing. Um, and what was expected from a recording when the quality went from uh, LP to to the CDs, and you see it. I mean, you, when you hear the, center, the generation of LP recording singers against the generation of CD singers, it's other vocality is really different technique. Um, even in mu musically, uh, the the way Mozart was interpreted in, in one era or the other changed. Uh, because of the technology. So we'll see what's the effect. I hope, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what this technology will, how it will affect the way we yeah. sing. Well, it's, it's, it's strange because when I, the more I listen to this sort of new opera, uh, yes, there are some kind of neo-romantic things going on where you basically sing it the same way um, as you would any, you know, opera, but, or romantic, as you would romantic opera. But uh, there's a, it seems to me that people are really experimenting with a lot of different vocal textures right now in, in new opera. And um, that can be confusing uh, because, because of, I mean, you, you said that, I mean, it's true that we identify a certain style of singing with opera as well. And I, I'm hearing that less and less in a lot of new um, yeah. works, you know? Yes. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, in, it's, it's, interesting i wonder i mean singing for microphone is a, a style of singing i would say in its own right would you would you absolutely agree? yeah yeah absolutely and absolutely. i mean it has its there's virtuosic aspects to it as well i think you can do things on microphone that you can't do in a big hall um, but we're not trained Correct. that way we're kind of in this weird in-between phase when it when we're trained in this very traditional way and then we enter this world that has very different demands in that respect Absolutely. Listen, I did my, my undergrad and two a, a master's and a professional studies diploma here. So it was eight years of classical singing training. How many times did I stand in front of a mic in those eight years? <laughs> Never. Yeah. Not one time. Mm. Um, I did for my own things, but nothing, mm -hmm. my colleagues, nobody's getting trained for that or knowing mm -hmm. what to ask from a sound engineer yeah. or how to produce in a different way. Um, mm. So we, we are adapting, we are learning. Um, if, mm. you, if you were singing jazz, you knew if you were singing, you know, something else that required... Um, yeah, it's 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 a curious. It's interesting what you were saying. I mean, how we how would this change impact the the works, mm -hmm. the, the new works that are coming mm -hmm. um, in in the in the in the vocal style? Um, I'm, I'm quite. I, I I I'm I'm old fashioned in that way. In a way, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I how how can I put it? Because I'm still interested in. I like. As you saw me, I try different ways, and I like mm -hmm. to use different colors in my voice. But I, I'm interested in. I like the the traditional sound very much. Mm -hmm. I want it to be part of my creative world, and I want it to stay alive out there in the world as well. Yeah. What do you think? What 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 style do you like better? <laughs> you know, I well, I like you have been trained very just in the traditional operatic style. And what I what I um, got frustrated with is not the lack of options that you then have for interpreting things. So after school, basically, I had to go on my, I had to do some self-work <laughs> so that I have all these colors and, and more options in my voice. And it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, I am kind of falling out of love uh, with a certain, with the, with the traditional operatic singing, but that can just, you know, just be a, a phase. Maybe, maybe I'm falling out of love of, with it because it just really, um, I hear how it, how it doesn't quite, it, it, it's like something that's, it's like a bull in a China shop when you're trying to, <laughs> when you're trying to record it. It's like, it's a little, it's just a little bit too like unruly and big for that. And it doesn't have the kind of grace that, you know, real rec like recording artists are able to have. Some of these new music people that, that really specialize in new music have just this very like straight tone, particular sound. And maybe it's going out of fashion now, but um, 
you know, and people are accepting more vibrato also in in Baroque music and in in contemporary, you know, classical music. Correct. But there's part of me that does like that clean sound, <laughs> even though even if I can't <laughs> do it very well, you know. <laughs> So, but do you like uh, it in recordings or you expect it in live performances as well? Well, that's an interesting thing. It, you know, it's so startling to hear live, uh, to, to hear performers that you've only ever heard as recording artists. Um, some of them are actual operatic artists. Like when I heard Joyce Didonato live, for example, yeah. it's very surprising um, <laughs> that you don't actually hear the, the voice that you hear on the recording. Correct. It's a different voice. You don't hear as much of it. In other voices it's like suddenly the voice is there and you didn't hear it before on the recording. Correct. Correct. It's so, it's so, and it's so, and I, I often have this experience like on master classes that I record, for example, um, <laughs> where I hear all these singers and I hear them in the hall and some singer might have an, inc this incredible shiny voice that's just both bright, but it also just fills the room. And then you hear it on the recording and it's like, eh, I don't, you know, yeah. it's nothing. So something it's, and I'm sure a good recording artist could could sort of recreate it, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, we're we've also become really accustomed to low. Paradoxically, we've become <laughs> yes. accustomed to low quality recordings. Yes. Um, and we, I don't think everyone really realizes how much that can do to a voice. You know, how much that can change, how much it can take away. Um. So and it's That's and, true. and it's really That's a huge like fascinating. Um, just uh, and I and I've read also that you know record people who really understand recording they understand it's an act of creation. Cre you're recreating something, Correct. but you're really creating a new thing. You know, uh, I don't know if you got to see um, one production I directed this year, called Fedora with Teatro Grattacielo. We recorded it live, um, so with no audience last October. Um, in, a, in, in an empty, like a black box a theater, large mm -hmm. space, and the voices were real voices, operatic voices, mm -hmm. and this is Verismo, and it was like mm -hmm. really, you know, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And we had a very good uh, sound engineer mm -hmm. that just placed a few microphones. You don't see them in the camera. They are mm -hmm. like, there's a little microphone under the piano, and there's three or four mics uh, around the room. And he was sitting there with his, I mean, really creating, just the way you were saying, he was one more mm -hmm. artist in the room. Mm -hmm. um, his job was really not only to archive, let's say, but or to register what was going on, but to um, shape the sounds mm -hmm. and um, the sounds and the silence and everything that was mm -hmm. going on. Um, it, it was really interesting. He's a very, very experienced uh, sound engineer and I could see his eyes, you know, yeah. he's really trying, he would keep mm -hmm. showing me, look, look at this, look at this, look at this. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's really an art form and, uh, yeah. and, and as you say, in capturing, capturing the human voice, especially when it's, uh, how it interacts with a space um, it's a challenge yeah it, it's it's yeah it's not the same with the little microphone at, at home no <laughs> and and I think I don't know what your experience is it might be different in New York but it's very difficult to find a recording engineer that is really like passionate and understands uh what they're trying to do <laughs> understands the sound they they have to understand the sound and not yes all of they them have to have experience with this kind of yeah. singing which as you we were saying before since the amplification it's not a thing in the mm -hmm. in the classical world in general uh, it, there's very few people ha who have experience with it um, only people that work were big uh, big houses or you know for some reason we're exposed to the uh, to recording uh, art, classical classical singings. I mean, of course, there's over the years it has happened. There's a lot, but it's not mm -hmm. as common as somebody who can record a rock band. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's true. In, in that, that's a good thing about New York that there's just a lot of people and a lot of artists mm -hmm. from all over the world. But but you're right; it's difficult to find uh, people who who know to do it well. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. passionate about it. Well, hopefully this time will sort of raise a new generation <laughs> of recording artists. <laughs> and they should yeah, be called recording artists, really. You're right. 
<laughs> so I, a, a little bit of a turn. I, I noticed you you sing in Morning Star, this vocal improvisation uh, group. Yeah, moving moving star. <laughs> moving star. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I was wondering. I've I've actually never heard of a of a vocal just vocal improvisation group. Oh, that's so um, cool. We have to have you over. <laughs> maybe this is just my ignorance, but I, I haven't heard of just like a, an ensemble singing, uh, like a vocal ensemble doing it. So what are some of the methods that, that they use to, to oh, sort of Oh, it's so much fun. Um, yeah. we, when <laughs> you bet. come to New York, we'll have you, when, when, when we meet again in person, we'll have you over yeah. now we're meeting online. Um, it's it, Moving Star is a group of diverse singers that I mean, we have some composers some just singers I'm uh, there's a couple of classical singers uh, and there's actually a few people that are specialists in vocal improvisation mm. um, it's so much fun um, mm. the, look the, the spectrum of things we do goes from mm what we will call games, uh, mm -hmm. circle songs. I don't know if you're familiar with Bobby McFerrin and the yeah. work he does. So um, this, this idea, which is games with structures, okay, now you are create, you're improvising a loop that is the mm -hmm. base of this ensemble, and then the next person will create a little pattern that goes with your bass, mm -hmm. and then somebody will do here a rhythm, and somebody will mm -hmm. solo over this. So from... We have a, a huge repertoire of that kind of proposals that bring mm -hmm. on just uh, songs that are made up on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, but since we're together for several years, that took different shapes. Then suddenly we mm -hmm. found something we like. So somebody took it home and brought back home next week a structure that we want to repeat. Or somebody mm -hmm. has a poem that they want to write a song over. Um, and sometimes that becomes a score, a classical choral score. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's a score that it's that has a part, open part for for improvisation with this directions. Let's say you need to make mm -hmm. it this way. It needs to use only these mm -hmm. notes, and it need, they need to be, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, it's yeah. actually really exciting, really creative. And it's it's yeah. a place for. Um, it's actually it came from the from from what I know one of the the founders of the group, the composer, and he was interested in investigating that spark. Uh, mm. He was saying basically between nothing and the mm. composed piece, there's improvisation. Mm. <laughs> when somebody writes for the first time a musical phrase, that's improvisation. Then it becomes, mm -hmm. then when you repeat it, you write it down, it becomes a composition. Mm -hmm. But he he was curious about, he said, let's create a group that is just amplifies that little spark, that spark mm -hmm. of creative, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, of creation. Do you ever do any like audience interaction where they maybe give you an idea, like like sometimes improv comedy improvs group do that, groups? Yes, do this, yeah. yes. Well, <laughs> what we did is when we were performing live, uh, we we in, in in the concerts we had some pieces that were rehearsed, and then some pieces that had, for example, uh, open places for an audience member to jump in and do mm -hmm. something, and we would mm -hmm. adapt, you know, sing around. Mm -hmm. Um, there were, and there's a lot of this kind of games, as I was describing before, of uh, mm -hmm. circle singing that include the audience, uh, where you can tell them, okay, now you sing this, uh, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and it takes different shapes. Yes, we did a lot of that. Now, in the last year, we're working online, and actually, mm -hmm. we, uh, one of our members, it's working with a method in which we are all singing live uh, from mm -hmm. home. And we are, mm -hmm. the, the delay is so short that we are actually improvising yeah. live, uh, which mm. is awesome. We did a couple yeah. of concerts already, and the audience is seeing seven singers, each one. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a friend in, in L.A., another friend in in uh, Memphis, and th then we are here around in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And everybody's singing from home, and you're hearing it live, which is I didn't see anybody else doing that. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's Moving Star. Did improv come naturally to you, or was it something that you really had to, like, you were nervous about in the beginning? I'm still very, very nerve-wracking. Yeah. <laughs> um, also because this is a group that um, 
of composers and improvisers mm. and and I come here with my little score you know I'm I'm yeah. trained to sing when it's in the page and really sing exactly the rhythm that is in the page right mm -hmm. um and I felt I still feel every now and then oh that was not right you know I just sang something and mm -hmm. that was so silly um it's it's interesting you know when when we have a those structures you know you're next mm -hmm. for the next improvisation i'm like yeah. <laughs> and and the whole point is that you know you don't uh, you don't plan it that you do you, you yeah. know you're right the way like if you were surfing you can't think this is the moment in which i was i will stand now you need to see how it's coming um mm -hmm. yeah it was an, absolutely a learning curve Mm -hmm. And um, I think it still is. I, it's always I'm always trying to bring my best, the best I can do to mm -hmm. the group, uh, and, and learn. Yes, for anybody hearing, mm -hmm. all of this has been a learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> the learning the tech, the learning to direct, the learning to improvise. Mm -hmm. All of the learning is always mm -hmm. there's always a part of me that thinks, "What? Who do you think you are? What do you think you will do?" <laughs> I'm sure they also inform each other that you've become a different performer because you direct and you've become a different musician because you improvise and and a different yes. director because you improvise. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I, I, I think so. I hope so. Yeah. That's a good thing about growing growing up mm -hmm. that suddenly you have you said, Oh well, I already did this before and then I survived. Let, let's mm -hmm. let's try it. Um <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I, I can see when you have an idea, when you have a feeling that something you want to try, that mm -hmm. um, it's interesting for me to see that people react um, mm -hmm. in general when when something is, I, it keeps an idea that keeps showing up. Mm -hmm. uh, when I can finally make it concrete in the world, um, it resonates. So that mm. that's that's exciting for me. What are your future projects that maybe listeners can attend online? Is Odradek going to have a future project? Is it going to have a future yes. iteration? Yes, Odradek needs oh, good, to good, have good. A, Yes, um, it's still still we are still uh, planning. Um, we want to do a, a Odradek number two. So uh, mm. Odradek was named exercises on the presence of Odradek with the idea that this you know there will uh, there will be a more finished with more mm -hmm. numbers, a longer uh, production. It doesn't have a date yet, but mm -hmm. um, next year for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm working, I, I think, I'm working with Teatro Grattacello, which I did mm -hmm. with Istofele and uh, Fedora. Mm -hmm. They didn't announce their productions, so I don't think I can <laughs> announce yet. Ah, but, okay. uh, but please go to, to grattacello.org. Um, and then you'll see we'll have a wonderful project this summer in Europe and two productions here in the fall mm -hmm. in New York City. Very mm -hmm. exciting projects. And this theater is a theater that specializes in lesser known uh, operatic works, yeah? Correct, yes. It's interesting what they have done for the last uh, 25 years um, here in New York City is concert versions of less performed uh, operatic repertoire. Uh, specifically towards very small, big, big, large uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. But in with uh, Stefanos Coronios, is the new artistic director, and he is interested in bridging on this uh, mm. tech-heavy uh, mm. uh, productions in which it's still concert version, in a way, there's no sets uh, or or costumes still now, now in the new productions, actually. <laughs> we are stepping out of that box. But um, it's still conservation, but we are using projections and interactive mm -hmm. media um, to enhance and, and yes, come to this, mm -hmm. this new frontier. So that, that is that is Grattacello. Um, I'm working with a composer in a group of songs that I'm, I'm singing. I'm singing with a, in a Vivaldi Gloria with the Fairfield County Chorale, who's doing an mm -hmm. online concert now in, mm -hmm. in April. You should check it. It's really beautiful, beautiful project. Mm -hmm. The whole Vivaldi Gloria uh, online with mm -hmm. it's choreographed and uh, the mm -hmm. arrangements of the orchestra are out mm -hmm. of the box. It's not the traditional yeah. arrangement. So mm -hmm. it's with other instruments and it's really cool and moving star has a concert also in april you can check mm -hmm. their website 
at moviestar, movingstar.org. Mm -hmm. um, also online? Also online. Yeah. Also, everything is virtual here in this in New York, at least till the fall, everything mm. is online. Mm. Um, yes, am I forgetting anything? That I, I worked on a piece called The Late Walk with Bear Opera last mm -hmm. um, last year, and it's going to the to the Library of Congress in mm. in Washington. So that's it's a huge thing for for America. It's like it's the official library so it becomes immortal when it goes there so it's a that's very exciting that's coming up soon too so so that's that's all that i i think that's yeah. all i have coming that's up. a lot for now i think <laughs> a lot. Yes. it's a lot for, yes. for corona time yeah i'm always just amazed at how uh, people innovate in these in these situations um, yeah yeah totally so, and 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 yeah. and the audience even though everybody's fried and exhausted of watching mm -hmm. stuff online there's still movement and there's still you know mm -hmm. uh, the people still need arts it's 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 what what we are as humans and we're mm -hmm. still looking for that that connection so i mean i still I, i find myself crying in front of our little video about you know just mm -hmm. watching a performance that is um I don't know. I I I I, I'm, I teach uh, high schoolers singing, mm -hmm. and I I I find myself in in lessons in Zoom looking for performances for examples of songs I recommend for them. And I'm like oh, this performance. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I imagine it happens to other people as well that we are in need of 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 art yeah. because it's a very traumatic moment. I I would thank you for coming on and and. Uh talking about the future of opera thank you so much emma it was so interesting you, you had such such a such an insight it was really wonderful to very inspiring for me to talk to you thank you well i'm, I'm inspired by by your work i mean that's what this podcast is, is about is I'm, i really appreciate artists that are are bringing the uh their respective art forms forward you know and and that are doing that independently um That's really important, yeah, as well. Thank you so much. So, I, I really appreciate you. it. It's, it's, it makes me, it makes it makes me happy, <laughs> you know, when it's working with the head down and suddenly to to feel appreciated like that. It makes me it makes me very happy. I hope you enjoyed that convo. Please check out Malena's upcoming projects. I've left them all in the description, and maybe we'll virtually see each other there. The gorgeous song you're listening to right now is the popular Cielito Lindo in an arrangement inspired by Satie's Gymnopédie No. 1, performed by Malena and her husband as part of New Air's Tango. I highly recommend you listen to the entire performance, linked in the description, along with the rest of the music in this episode. Hey, and did you know that you can become a patron of On The Verge and get access to all sorts of backstage content? You can check out what patrons have been able to enjoy so far on my patrons page. If that's too much for you, you can follow the On The Verge series on social media, especially my new Instagram, where I've started posting brief backstage clips in my stories as well. And the best way to keep up with everything happening on The Verge is to sign up for the newsletter, which I send out on the 13th of every month. And most importantly, get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Everything I just mentioned, contact info, patron access, social media links, a brief description of what the heck it means to be on The Verge, and more, is at onthevergetrilogy.com. No W's. Here's to being on The Verge. <laughs>